denazification, demilitarization and the protection of the Russian-speaking population. These were the goals outlined by Vladimir Putin when he ordered the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. After two years of a bloody full-scale invasion, there are no Nazis in the Ukrainian government. Civilian objects are being attacked, and both the Russian-speaking and Ukrainian-speaking populations are suffered equally from the Russian onslaught. The question is, what is Putin's real motive in seeking control over Ukraine? The first reason – an imperialist worldview. Three months before the full-scale invasion, on the 12th of December 2021, Russian President Vladimir Putin publicly declared that the collapse of the USSR was a personal tragedy for him. Крушение Советского Союза было крупнейшей геополитической катастрофой века. Для российского же народа оно стало настоящей драмой. This statement clearly suggests that Moscow regards the former Soviet republics as part of Russian territory. Russia has been trying to reclaim them in various ways for over 30 years, since the collapse of the USSR. In 1999, Russia and Belarus signed an agreement to create a union state. Since Lukashenko's crackdown on protests in 2020, Belarus has been gradually integrated into Russia under the so-called Union State Project. This ultimately led to the involvement of Belarus in the aggression against Ukraine by allowing its territory to be used for the Russian attack on Ukraine. In essence, it was an attempt to create a miniature version of the USSR that would influence over the former Soviet republics within its sphere of control. The Speaker of the Armenian Parliament has spoken out about Russian attempts to pressure his country into joining the Union state. The seizure of Ukraine, therefore, fits perfectly into Putin's strategy of restoring the Soviet Empire. During his more than 20 years in power, Putin has systematically rebuilt the Soviet Union within Russia. Central to the USSR's success was the Iron Curtain. Soviet citizens literally knew no other life beyond the party-controlled borders of the Union. This leads us to the second reason. The European-oriented development of an independent Ukraine posed a threat to the Putin's regime. Ukraine, while still had strong social and economic ties with Russia, was gradually becoming a showcase of the democratic world for its neighbors. During Putin's reign in Russia, Ukraine has seen six presidents come and go. Ukraine follows the concept of civil rights and freedoms. Oppression, harassment and corruption have always been met with a response a direct expression of the will of the people. Ukrainians really have the freedom to express their disagreement with the unlawful actions of the authorities, as demonstrated by the Orange Revolution and the Revolution of Dignity. In 2004, when pro-Russian presidential candidate Viktor Yanukovych tried to rig the election, the Ukrainian people successfully defended their choice through protests. In 2013-2014, the Revolution of Dignity unfolded in response to a series of decisions by Viktor Yanukovych that jeopardized the European aspirations of the Ukrainian people, Ukraine's democratic system and the fundamental rights and freedoms of its citizens. Progress towards democracy and the strengthening of European ties have allowed Ukrainians to travel freely throughout Europe without the need for visas. The corrupt Soviet-style militia has been reformed and transformed into more modern police force. Even the occupation of Crimea and the war in Donbass, which Putin started in 2014, did not slow down economic growth. Ukraine's GDP rebounded from a low of $91 billion in 2015 to $199 billion in 2021, after initially falling from $134 billion. Putin's aggression has always been a tactic aimed at undermining Ukraine's status as an example of democracy in central and Eastern Europe. In 2008, Putin launched an attack on Georgia to prevent it from aligning itself with the Western world. In general, war has always served to boost Putin's domestic approval ratings. He came to power on the wave of the Second Chechen War. It also worked in 2008 when Putin attacked Georgia, and then in 2014 when he annexed Crimea from Ukraine. That is reason number three. The graph shows that before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Putin's approval rating was falling. After the attack on Ukraine, however, it began to rise again. Reason number four. The desire to destroy Ukraine. Vladimir Putin and his supporters insist that Ukraine has never existed as a state. The Russian army is deliberately targeting civilian infrastructure to leave Ukrainians without electricity, water and heating. The Kremlin orders missiles to be fired at residential 
residential buildings, clinics, theaters, and maternity hospitals. Entire cities are being destroyed along with their civilian populations. Taken together, it appears to be a concerted effort to destroy Ukrainians as a nation and Ukraine as a sovereign state. Putin has consistently claimed that Ukraine's NATO membership is a threat to Russia. Yet Russia's border with NATO grew from 1,215 to 2,600 kilometers as a result of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. His aim was to demilitarize Ukraine. Instead, Russia's aggression led to a significant increase in the size of the Ukrainian army. He supposedly came to rescue the Russian world in Ukraine, but he completely destroyed cities like Mariupol, where 89% of the population spoke Russian. So Russia's real aim is the total annexation of Ukraine and its incorporation into the empire. Total destruction. After all, a neighboring democratic state poses a direct threat to the dictatorship that the current Russian leadership has chosen as its preferred style of governance.